Hello and welcome to episode number 24 from the Self-Publishing Formula. Two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to an episode that's going to focus on social media ads, including especially, I should say, Facebook advertising. Uh, Mark, you are known as a bit of a guru on Facebook ads within the uh, self-publishing world. Where are you with them at the moment? They're still, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Still being sort of the prime area for you. But this guy, Deepesh, he's somebody you noticed quite early on as, as making waves in this area. I did, yeah. So um, I can't remember exactly how I was hooked up with him. It may have been through the guys at Z who we were talking, I was talking to. Yeah, Deepesh is behind or, or was working for a company that produced uh, a very well-received children's book called Lost My Name. They built that uh, business off the back of a lot of Facebook advertising. And I saw those ads quite frequently because I've got two small kids. So they were targeting effectively enough to catch me. So I was in their target market and uh, we did actually buy a couple of those for, for Freya and Samuel and I thought it'd be interesting to talk to him just to see what he's been doing kind of slightly outside of our usual space to see uh, if we can get any uh, interesting information from him as to how to optimize Facebook ad campaigns and also we get lots of um, questions from uh, writers who are writing books for uh, for children and for slightly older children and um, obviously these books are, are aimed at young children so you're not aiming at the audience that, that are going to be uh, either reading them or being read to you're 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 aiming for to the people who are going to be buying those books for them so um i've you know it is a little bit more tricky to to target um, those kinds of audiences but it can be done and um lost my name is a really good example of when it's done right just how, how effective it can be yeah, well, the important breakthrough that Deepesh talks about in the interview in more detail is is understanding that people were buying the book to gift, so it was really targeting aunts, uncles, godparents and grandparents uh, was their big breakthrough. The other thing that uh, Deepesh does, as I say, uh, he, he, and I mentioned this last week, that he is the guy who's brought into startups and his focusing, his targeting is is superb to the point where I work from home, you do as well, Mark, and I think for both of us, coffee is quite important and um, I ended up subscribing to this service called Packed Coffee in the UK. A slightly new way of doing it where their their thing is that they really cut down on the time between the coffee bean being picked and produced and, and, and being packaged and sent to you so it's as fresh as you could possibly get it and it comes from very small sourced farmers and uh, guess who was running their Facebook ads campaigns it turns out it was Deepesh so yeah it dropped into my timeline and he he somehow worked out through his algorithms that uh, those of us who are self-employed are big target markets for that so yeah he's good and it was a really really good interview as I say we had a little blip in the middle due to broadband failures but uh, we got the bulk of this out and uh, very well worth listening to and definitely as I said at the end of the interview to Deepesh this is somebody we will be talking to annually I think because he is somebody who understands the market and how it it's moving uh, and which direction it's going very useful stuff so without further ado here is Deepesh Mandalia. Okay, now Mark is well known for his expertise in Facebook advertising, but guess what? He's not the only one around. Uh, Deepesh Mandalia has some major success stories with the ads platform behind him. Most intriguingly for us is his success with a children's book series, Lost My Name. Uh, Deepesh now works specifically with startups and delighted to say he joins us now. Hello, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, this is pretty early for a podcast interview. So, um, you know, when you work in books and media, days start later quite often. But <laughs> let's uh, let's try and find the energy. So, Deepesh, let's I think just start with your approach. You've you discovered Facebook ads as I mean, certainly is it is it not your single tool that you use for uh, advertising, but it's it's a major one for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I first started working with Facebook ads in 2013, when the platform was in its infancy. You know, it's quite far behind Google AdWords. And predominantly, I'd kind of worked through Google AdWords over the kind of previous period. You know, it, it wasn't an instant hit. Um, it took a while to 
figure out how to get Facebook working uh, for a previous business prior to joining Lost My Name. And even at Lost My Name, it took a good six to eight weeks of hacking and testing to actually find traction. And actually, since we after we found traction, we just put the foot on the accelerator and it really took off. So let's talk about Lost My Name. Can you just describe the project for us? It's quite a unique uh, children's book, isn't it? Absolutely. So um, the founders, one of, one of the founders actually received a personalised book for his daughter. And as he read through it, he just didn't feel um, wowed by it. It just felt so bland. Um, it was a typical story of the child's name being inserted as uh, different kind of parts of the book in the, in the placeholders. And he got together with a few friends and said, look, we should be able to do something better than this. And actually the core of the book that they developed as an idea was to take each letter of a child's name and create mini stories for each letter. So rather than putting David in different parts of the book, the book became completely about David. So just as the story was, David would wake up, um, he's forgotten his name, and he'd go on an adventure. And each character he meets along the way would give um, David part of the letter of, the, of his name. So he might meet a dragon, an angel, a viking, etc., etc. And at the end of it, He's got all the letters for his name. And it was quite a unique way of personalising books, which had never been done before. Well, it's a, it's a way that fits right into, you know, what's going to, you know, get a child excited is going Absolutely. to a book discovering their name like that. So brilliant, a brilliant idea. But as we all know, having a good idea is uh, only the start of it. So, so you came in and with no real confidence behind you about Facebook ads, you pressed ahead and, as you said, went through several weeks of perhaps not getting the results you wanted. Why did you think it was going to work for you in the end? Um, so I think one of the key things and one of the aspects that's often missed around developing a new product is this whole theory of product market fit. So it's having a product that um, is viable to a, a, a consumer segment. And actually what uh, what Lost My Name had done previously, they'd launched a book in 2012. It was shoddy. It was hacked together. And over the next kind of 12 to 18 months, they developed it with feedback from friends and family predominantly. And actually, end of 2013, um, they started selling through Not On The High Street as a reseller. And that was their first kind of marketing traction point. So... At that point, the founders actually packed up their day jobs because this was a side project and went full time into Lost My Name in 2014. And I joined in March to support with just trying to find growth. You know, there was no remit to go for a specific channel. And at that time, um, you know, my view was they've obviously seen traction on Not The High Street. So there is a demand for it. The book had really positive feedback. So if we could just find the right consumer, we should be able to shift a few more books. And at that stage, we were spinning multiple plates. So we tried paid search, display ads, Facebook, and a few others. And it's really a case of pushing all of them and seeing which ones would stick. And ultimately, they all fell away except Facebook. Um, so to give you an example, um, Lost My Name actually started with uh, Facebook advertising in October 2013. So it was a good six months prior to me joining that they'd already been running Facebook ads unsuccessfully. So I had something to work with. What we kind of found was that we weren't kind of using the platform in the way the platform should be used. So there were, being a new platform, there's a whole discovery phase of trying to figure out exactly how we should be doing our advertising. And then once we got that in play, it was working on the communication part of it and getting the proposition right for the consumer. Um, and, and that's the thing that really helps us to gain traction. So just just to take it back a step, I mean, getting that fit and you're talking about matching the audience and the environment uh, to the product, which is obviously a very important uh, part of it. Were you going for mailing lists at this stage? Were you using a mailing list to build the sales around or were you direct advertising? We were direct advertising. So by that point, we'd already generated some sales. So one of the key aspects of Facebook and which differentiates it from any other platforms is you can take email lists, you can upload it into Facebook and find more similar audiences. And, you know, we already had some sales. So we used that as an opportunity to find uh, more people that were similar to the ones that had already bought the book. So that definitely helped us to take a step forward. And also, we were doing a lot of work around interest targeting. So trying to understand our demographic and trying to find them by their profile. So one of the big key differentiators between Google AdWords and Facebook advertising is that Google AdWords predominantly relies on an intent. So I, I want to buy a children's gift. I want to buy a TV, etc. Whereas Facebook is 
a step before that. So someone may not actually be looking for something, but if they see something of interest, they may click through. And I kind of relate Facebook advertising to TV, where it's interrupting your media consumption and trying to target you with a relevant ad. Whereas, um, you know, with Facebook, although that approach is similar, the level of targeting and tracking is, you know, 100x what you can do on TV. And that creates a key differentiator for us where we were able to push the book in front of consumers before they realized that they would be interested in this. And then that gave us a big step forward. So a, an important part, and they call it remarketing in AdWords, don't they? But the, the lookalike lists, I guess, is the is the method you're using in Facebook. We presumably also did use the traditional targeting in Facebook. Was that where you were struggling with, or did you start to refine that and find a way of, of reaching an audience through just using Facebook targeting? Um, it's a combination of um, all things, I think. You know, we the, the work that Lost My Name were doing prior to me joining, they, they were looking at all the right areas within Facebook. It just wasn't done in the right way. So there's a technical aspect of Facebook that you absolutely need to get right. Things like pixels on the site, how you're using those pixels, uh, how the account is structured, how your bidding is set up, your optimization, etc. There's a whole batch of technical things, which unless you get those things right, your creative and comms are not going to be as effective as they need to be. So really my initial work was in fixing the technical aspects of the platform and then working on the communications and trying to get the proposition across to the right people. And really once those two things came together, then it started to kick off for us. Do you mind me asking how big this campaign was? I mean, how much money were they putting into it and what sort of return level and percentage terms were they looking for, were you expecting? I don't suppose you knew actually at this point, but... Yeah, there's no expectation. So, you know, when I joined, we were spending three to four grand a month and making that back roughly, if, if not slightly less. And, you know, as a, as a profit, there was no profit in that because we were not making our margin back on the sales. So at that point, it was a 0% ROI and anything better than that was seen as a success for the business. So to give you a kind of idea, by May, we had hit 450% ROI in Facebook advertising and our budgets has gone up three, fourfold. So we'd managed to grow our spend as well as massively growing our return. And that kind of level of ROI continued throughout 2014, which enabled us to just grow at a phenomenal pace. Mm. And that's the sort of ROI figures you only really hear talked about in social media advertising, particularly Facebook <laughs> advertising. So then you funneled, you shoveled the cash in when you hit the winning formula, which of course is, is usually the right way to do it. Doing it cautiously, of course, making sure that you're not having a drop off of that ROI. But that worked for you. It must have been a good feeling. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, I've worked with lots of startups that have a similar vision of starting small, pumping in their profits and growing big. And what I always say to startups of any size is don't spend money that you can't afford to lose. So if all you can afford is £20 a day or £10 a day, then that's fine. Stick to that, but be prepared to lose it. You know, I've seen startup after startup that is taken – anywhere between four and 12 weeks to find that traction point and hit profitability. So a company I worked with um, at the start of the year, they were a kind of beauty app and they had some really small budgets and it took them three months to find traction. And now they've hit some really decent sales figures, but because their spend levels were so low, it took them far longer to make those learnings. With Lost My Name, we already had six months of data. And then it took, even then, it took another kind of uh, four to six weeks to really find our sweet spot, by which point then we started to plow more money into it because we knew that we were able to create a return. Yeah, that's a really good point. That you, you do need to almost divide up your growth period, your startup period, into this period where it is going to be an investment, it is going to be finding your way, and you may not see instant results. And we do see, you know, people come to Mark quite a lot running their campaigns and sometimes they're in day two saying mm. something's failed in my ad I haven't had a single sign up in two days and think well five weeks time <laughs> when you've continued to tweak and find and modify and change things and absolutely if you're still panicking then come back to us but yeah, and you, you absolutely need to see it as an investment I think you're right I want to talk about children's books just for a second because it's one of those areas certainly amongst the SPF community where the children's authors have had a tougher time than the romance authors, for instance, and the thriller authors in finding their audience on Facebook and making it work. But you're, this is a really phenomenal success story with a children's book. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's an interesting thing that I've worked with other children's products as well. And 
there's a huge demand for children's products on Facebook. Um, and I think it's, you know, part of it is obviously finding the right audience, but it's creating the message that's going to cut through. So if you look at any of the Facebook case studies and videos and pieces that they've put together, they talk about thumb stopping content. So it's not, it's not just that you have to find the right person. It's creating something that's going to stop them scrolling past your ad um, in their newsfeed. So whether it's mobile or desktop, you need to disrupt that flow. So it could be in the way you develop your creative. It could be the copy. Um, it could be a combination of both. And that's one thing which I think a lot of advertisers fail to understand. You know, no one's on Facebook with the intent of looking for an ad and looking to buy. Some people are open to it and they're the people that you want to target. But if you imagine um, in any given day, someone could see 5, 10, 15 different ads coming up in their newsfeed at different times of the day. So in the morning, you're on your commute into work, you're browsing Facebook. You've only got a limited time, so you're not really going to buy then. Maybe at lunchtime, you've got a bit more time. And in the evening time, you're a bit more relaxed, so you've got more time to kind of scroll through. And one of the key things about how Facebook works is it targets you at specific times in the day knowing what you do on Facebook. So if every morning it knows generally you log in between, let's say, 7.30 and 8.30 on your commute in, it may just drop a few ads in at that moment in time. You may not interact, but you've seen it. And what Facebook will then do is target you at a time of day that it knows you're more likely to interact. So it might come back at six o'clock and serve you another ad from the same advertiser and then prompt you to take that um, action. So whether it's a click, sign up or download. And what I found, again, through lots of advertisers is that they don't understand the concept of keeping ads running and letting the algorithm identify your key users and how they interact with ads as well. You know, some people, you know, we had big success with our children's book with the 55 plus market. I was at a mm. conference two months ago um, on behalf of Facebook and someone said to me, Facebook's irrelevant for me because I have a 55 plus market and they're not on Facebook. Well, actually, when Lost My Name launched into the US, our traction came through the 55 plus market. The 25 to 45, which was our core in the UK, were really expensive and hard to reach in the US because of the level of competition. But when we launched it to the grandparents in the, in the US, you know, they've got the expendable income and they're, they're actually dwelling far longer. You know, they're using Facebook far longer than their younger counterparts because they have a bit more time. So I think part of it's understanding, although it may be a children's book, it's not just the parents that are buying. And this is one of the interesting insights we had at Lost My Name. After surveying the customers that we had, it was just a simple question of why are you buying this book? Who's it for? And actually, we went into advertising thinking that we're targeting parents. And we came out of it realizing it's actually the gifters that we're after because it's a personalized book. It was, it's such a nice keepsake. Actually, it was a gifting market that we had to target. Actually, one of the interesting stories was that one of the ads was in particular performing well and outperforming other ads. And actually, it was badly written. It was a very grainy picture of the book. And it was written with kind of emoticons and it just didn't feel like it was um, representing the, the product in the right way. So actually coming in as a marketer, what I tried to do was to create ads that would challenge that, but using kind of marketing best practice. So shorter copy, using more kind of uh, persuasive copy and using better professionally shot photography as well. And actually what we found over a period of four to six weeks was that the ads that we would put up would continuously fail to beat the existing ad. And actually, when we went through it and we looked at it in context, one of the key things that we realized is that when you're in the Facebook newsfeed and you look at your friends' updates, they're updating photography from their phone, videos from their phone, which might be shaky, and, and copy, which may have spelling mistakes or otherwise, Actually, when you then present an ad in that newsfeed, which is entirely professional, um, well-written, it stands out. It stands out like a sore thumb, and actually, that's a bad thing. If anything does look out of place um, when you're in your kind of browse mode, then people will ignore it, and, and that's something that we found quite early on. So we actually went back to the drawing board and reworked the copy to make it a lot more natural, make it more conversational, and we actually reworked the photography in, in terms of making it fit in with your kind of newsfeed update. So rather than trying to stage professional shots, we were selecting shots which felt almost like customers had submitted them. 
and actually they started to create more traction for us. And actually that continued through 2014 of using as, as natural photography as we could find and copy which just felt conversational and friendly. So that was our kind of first cut through. Going into 2015, by that point, we'd caught the eye of um, Facebook and they invited us into a creative workshop um, at their head office to talk about how we could take a step up in creative thinking. And, you know, actually at that point, both myself and the creative team were quite apprehensive. We, we thought that, you know what, we, we get this, we'll get this better than Facebook do. And we just went into that with no expectations. And actually what we came out with was a whole new way of thinking about how we sell the product. And what we'd previously been doing was selling the book as a great personalized book and as a great personalized gift. But in reality, we were missing out the kind of core proponent of what the book was about, which was about the child and the personalization of the child's name. And actually, one of the creative ideas that came out was pulling out a creative which showed the child's name. So David, D-A-V-I-D, the characters that child would meet in the creative. So um, the D would have a dragon next to it. The A would have an angel, for, exa for example. And then actually creating a copy around you know, David meets a dragon, an angel, a viking, etc., etc. Who will your child meet on their adventure? Actually, what we found was that really created a, a big, big cut through beyond trying to sell a book to trying to sell the magic behind the book. So the analogy I use here is of focusing on the sizzle over the sausage. So the example that we used and referenced at the time was uh, someone like M&S. So M&S sells salmon. The quality is not that different to what Sainsbury's sell. But the way that M&S packaged it up is all about the quality. It's, um, you know, the ads talk about how the salmon has been caught and how it's been processed and developed. And it actually makes it feel a lot more enticing than just buying salmon, uh, which a lot of other companies would be selling. And so that, that's where we started to focus on our sizzle, which was this wow moment of the child discovering that the book was about them. And that's really what helps us to take another level up in terms of a creative message, which um, from the photography disrupted the user's flow through their newsfeed, got them interested in the ad, and the copy which created intrigue and got people to click to the site. Um, and that intrigue and curiosity really helps to get them off of the Facebook platform and onto your website to find out more. That's really interesting, Dupesh. I love hearing uh, valuable information like that, where you know there's thousands of dollars have gone into getting to you, <laughs> getting to that point of understanding it. But that again is quite once you say it, intuitive. But you wouldn't necessarily guess that your your advertising in w the timeline is essentially a user generated content area, isn't it? It's people with their thoughts and their sometimes ramblings and their amateur photographs, and actually. Why would you want to stand out as being? I did see an, an advert the other day. We're doing a YouTube ads course, which I'll come on to in a moment. But one of the examples, I just went online to get an example of an in-display in ad. And it was from Goldman Sachs. And it had a very generic headline. As an in-display advert, you're expecting somebody to be drawn to your advert and click on it, make an option to see it. It's not even in stream, doesn't even start playing. You know, I could look at that and just know there's nobody is going to be drawn to clicking on that advert. It spoke to nobody specifically. Uh, I don't really know what was the thinking behind it but it in the youtube environment again completely user generated very scrappy video a lot of the time it stood out like a sore thumb so trying to understand your context obviously is an important first step what a um, what an important way of, of learning that through that campaign a useful way of learning that through that campaign absolutely and i think that's um you know that's the old school of marketing it was you know we can't identify our customer too too well and we'll just send out a set of broad ads and see which one performs but you know in 2016 there's no excuse for not drilling down to creating a better understanding of your customer and based on the platform they're on so youtube you can do your demographic targeting you can do your interest targeting there's no excuse now not to be using things like that so i think it's it's more it's a combination of lazy marketing um, and a, la a lack of expertise, I think. Yeah. So you had great success with the with the children's book, and uh, and that's going to be heartening, certainly, to hear, and uh, very useful to, to make that discovery that with children's books, the gift market is probably going to be more successful for you than advertising directly to parents. You then have moved on to quite a few other startups. I mean, you've become a bit of a guru in the industry in this area. Uh, and do you find that you can apply the same techniques or is it bespoke to each place you go to, you have to kind of relearn and think how the environment's going to work specifically for that product? And, and perhaps you could let us know what other products you've worked on. 
Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. So um, I'd love to be able to blueprint this and just give it to everyone to kind of work on. But actually, you know, the two sides of it, the technical part, you can blueprint, and I've already got templates and kind of share those with startups. But the, the marketing part, the creative communications part, is so specific per sector and per company. And it takes time to identify the audiences and find that traction point. Generally, um, you know, there are a few approaches. So if you've got existing emails, then lookalike targeting is the absolute first thing that you should start on with Facebook. But then identifying those interests can help to kind of identify new audiences and grow quicker. So, you know, over the last, I think, what's probably the last 12 months, actually, I've worked with uh, software companies, I've worked with um, a beauty startup, I've worked with uh, kind of a few different publishing companies and kind of what I've found through all of them and also kind of my, most recently with Pack to Coffee, what I've found is finding the target market is the most difficult thing and actually when you do then find them, it's how do you manage your costs and increase your click-through rate to make it profitable. So, you know, step one is finding the audience and that's not always easy and then finding profitable audiences. And that's, you know, that's that's the panacea. If you can find a profitable audience and you can scale that, then that makes all the difference. You know, to give you a few ideas of different ways of approaching this, there's a methodology called Net Promoter Score. Net Promoter Score is a way of you as a company judging how many of your customers would recommend you as a business to friends and family. So you'd run a Net Promoter Score, customers would rate your business between zero and 10. Um, those rating 9 or 10 are your promoters. Those rating between 0 and 6 are detractors, and anywhere in between that are kind of on the fence. And, and you'd kind of weigh up the score of the percentage of promoters minus the percentage of detractors. That gives you a real strong gauge of how well your product is performing. And for me, I've, I've worked with you know maybe 10, 15 or more different startups, and there's a high correlation between the NPS score and how well that product is going to sell. So to give you an example, I think ASL, uh, sorry, Amazon, their net promoter score is 40 on a scale of mi minus 100 and plus 100. You know, Amazon, for, if you look at it from the outside, they're a hugely successful company, but they're not the best in terms of kind of customer experience. For Lost My Name, we index far higher than that. You know, I can't give you the exact numbers, but it's one of the highest NPS ratings I've ever seen. And I think part of that relayed into how... You know, I don't want to use the word easy, but how easy it was for us to cut through in terms of marketing, because we knew that we had an absolutely great product and a great experience. You know, don't discount the experience in actually buying the product. Um, that's your website. It's the emails followed up. It's your FAQs, etc. I worked with a startup a few years ago. Their NPS was, I think, minus 80. So that's the worst NPS I've seen. And actually, as much as we try to market the product, just people just weren't interested. It just wasn't a great product. Now, kind of leading on from that, what I found is those startups that have a higher NPS score, it's far easier to market them in Facebook. Um, so, you know, it's not all about the platform. It's not all about you can take any product on there and sell anything. You can't. The product has to be really good. And that's something which I focus on with startups, which is get your product and your product experience as good as you can get it. And then we can scale the marketing and, you, and then you will scale sales. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at selling a, a book, you need to think more than just the book. It's the whole buying experience. Um, what, what does the site tell you about the book, the author, the background? How, how much can you wrap into that sales process emotionally and kind of build up social proof? So, you know, reviews of the book, independent reviews from bookshops or reviewers, et cetera, et cetera. They all make a huge difference. Um, so it's kind of thinking beyond just selling a product on a platform thinking about selling a product with an experience. And I think that's that's one of the things that um, many startups fail to acknowledge early on. Tell me again how you actually, the mechanics of getting an NPS score. Is this done, something done professionally through a survey company or is this something that somebody with their own books could do, could replicate to get an NPS? Yeah, you, I do this myself. So um, there are tools available. Um, so one that I often uh, recommend to companies is a tool called delighted.com. You take your email list, you upload it into Delighted. Um, Delighted fires out the emails um, and it also collates the results back. So it'll give you everything within the platform. But you don't need at all. You can do it yourself. Um, you could use a type form survey, for example, which will allow you to 
create a survey for free. You can email that to your customers and it just simply needs to be one question of, would you recommend this product or service to friends and family? A rating from zero to 10. And if you look up NPS calculations, it will show you how to calculate your NPS. So you can do it yourself. The tools like Delighted, I think they charge something like $99 a month. So it really depends on what your budget is. But essentially what you want to do is do this on a regular basis and actually continue to gather that feedback over time. So for example, if you're launching new products um, over a period of months, that NPS score is sensitive to your products at that moment in time. And, and that kind of gives you an ongoing benchmark of how good your customers perceive your product or service as well. Mm, that could be really useful. So Dupesh, are you using a lot of other social media platforms at the moment or are you, are you the Facebook ads man? Yeah, I'm, I, I try not to be tied down or to be um, too kind of dependent on a single platform. So um, others that I've started working on more recently. So Instagram really took off for uh, Lost My Name last year and um, at Pact recently. Instagram was really, really uh, working well for us. And I've seen other um, brands working really well. And really where Instagram differentiates itself as a platform from Facebook, although the targeting, the ad setup is exactly the same as Facebook, where I mentioned that the Facebook creative should be a bit lo-fi, actually the inverse works better on, on Instagram. So actually the, the Instagram user is used to seeing really good, crisp, clean photography. And that's what um, works really well on Instagram. So um, for packed coffee, for example, recently, um, really nice enticing shots of coffee, um, being brewed in the espresso machine or using the kind of pour over method of a, a V60 um, brew method and kind of creating small videos and really making it feel like you can almost smell that coffee. That kind of creative works really well on Instagram. For Lost My Name also, we were one of the first, in fact, I think we may have been one of the very few UK um, clients to be on the Pinterest platform in the US last year. Um, and again, we saw some real traction there. It took me a while to understand Pinterest. You know, I'm not the target market. And actually, at the time um, that I was doing some testing, we were actually looking to renovate part of our house, the kids' room, etc. And Pinterest is great for coming up with ideas. So, you know, you want ideas for children's decor or birthday parties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's that's a key reason why people use uh, Pinterest. And actually, what we found again was that the gifting market. Uh, has so much potential on Pinterest as well. So people planning kids' parties, birth, they want birthday ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we, we saw that traction coming through Pinterest in the US last year. And in the UK, um, they launched, I think, in March or April. And yeah, I've seen companies pick up traction there as well. Are you using Twitter or YouTube? I've used Twitter in the past. I'm yet to see anything in terms of scalable success. I've seen small success around lead generation. So pushing Twitter ads in order to capture email addresses, that, that generally seems to work well. I'm yet to see an example of an e-commerce company that is selling a product that are able to make money. So really where Twitter and actually LinkedIn work really well is lead generation. For example, software companies. Um, so if you're looking to uh, get people to su subscribe to your software service, you can offer free downloads, white papers, etc. in exchange for an email address. And then you start your marketing communication around that. So Twitter's been quite limited in terms of direct sales. YouTube has been really good as a supporting channel for others. So for example, in Q4 last year, at Lost My Name, we started to use YouTube to broaden out our marketing to attract more people to the site. And they weren't directly buying from a YouTube ad, but what we were doing was filling our pot up of customers visiting the site so that we could retarget to more people through Facebook and other channels as well. So YouTube, you know, we ran that alongside TV advertising at that point, and it really helped to uh, amplify what we were doing. Okay, Deepesh, it's been um, absolutely brilliant talking to you. I've, I feel guilty we're taking the time of one of the world's busiest men. I should say I am a customer of yours inadvertently, because before we'd even come across each other's radar, I was a packed coffee customer as a result of a Facebook advert, and um, nice. I remain very happy with it, so... Obviously, your targeting works uh, works in that way. I think I'm going to ask you a final question, which is, I mean, for our audience, I think there's been a lot of very useful stuff, particularly at the beginning, talking about having patience during the investment phase um, and, and seeing that initial money going into adverts as an investment in the future, not necessarily something you're going to get immediately back in terms of sales. Uh, and and that, that doesn't necessarily 
uh, fall intuitively to somebody who's not really done marketing before and self-publishers are generally that person. So they're suddenly having to find themselves doing a marketing job alongside their writing job. Um, but going forward, what would you say then if you start to find your your campaigns working and you need to move up to the next level? You somehow want to um, you know, quit your job start to get the kind of income in that's going to mean that this is a business that's going to grow and potentially make you wealthier than you were even working in your nine to five. What are the key things you're advising your startups at that phase, having got things initially going? Are there, is there a specific ta- tactical platform uh, move here? Um, I think, you know, I, I, I kind of relate it again back to lost my name and, and it's to be cautious with your growth. So, you know, we we were cautious right from the beginning of, you know, we had additional budget we could have thrown in uh, early stages, but we wanted to do it in a measured way. So as we put more investment into the platform, we wanted to make sure that we were continuing to see returns. Everything was still working as it needed to be. Now, it's actually, if you fast forward from that early success into 2015, I think at Lost My Name, we, we entered a period of hubris where we just thought, you know what, we're on top of Facebook nothing could go wrong and we got to a phase of scaling our spend so so much that actually we weren't keeping track or keeping closer close track of our more detailed performance metrics and actually things started to unravel um so we were overreaching our customers you know there's only a finite number of people on facebook within your kind of selective targeting and we started to find that we were actually spamming customers we we're hitting them far too many times with ads and we got to a point where we were actually annoying far more people than was comfortable for the business and we actually started to regress in our performance and i think part of this is growing in a kind of mindful way of looking at the budget you're putting in the kind of ROI figures that you've been used to and knowing what your tolerances are so having a 450% ROI forever is never going to happen um, you'll you'll soon start to saturate uh, it took lost my name about 12 to 13 months to saturate and we had to reinvent our um, audience targeting which we did and we started to go, to go global US Europe and further afield but, you know, at that point, our confidence had reached such a peak that we just thought that nothing could go wrong. Many things can go wrong. You know, Facebook are constantly updating their platform. Advertisers, new advertisers are always coming onto the platform. You'll, you'll always find that someone's plowing in far too much money and making losses. So to give an example, around March, April time every year, it seems like big, big advertisers, you know, those guys that are spending anywhere between one and five million a month, a plowing budget into platforms like Facebook because it's the end of the financial mm-hmm. year. They need to get rid of that budget, otherwise they're gonna lose it and they're just plowing it in. And the knock-on effect for small advertisers is that your cost is then going to shoot up because the cost of bidding is uh, therefore higher with more money flying around. And actually, sometimes you have to ride the wave. I, I've done this with many companies where you do see these fluctuations of performance is going really well and then something just goes wrong. You can't explain it. And sometimes you still don't know what went wrong, but you know, two, three weeks later, your performance has recovered again. So it could be a Facebook change. It could be an external advertiser that's just knocked everyone out of the market. So part of it is, I think, just being a bit measured in terms of your growth and not expecting that yesterday's or last week's success is going to continue forever because generally it doesn't. Yeah, we definitely noticed that. I think our Facebook forums were full of people in the spring saying that suddenly their campaigns weren't effective and weren't working. But I don't know how others are feeling now. We're sitting recording this in July. We are seeing some of the best results we've had for the last 12 months at the moment. I mean, it leads for our main course that we were picking up for £3.50. We're now picking up for £1.40 and in our new course for 20 and 30 pence on occasions so I, I don't know if the big advertisers had all stepped back for a little bit and, and let us play but it's uh, we, personally we're seeing fantastic results yeah and there's also another thing at play around the summer in particular is that e-commerce in general takes a slight dip um, you know lots of people go on holiday people are at home with their children or you know work situations change um, and then actually e-commerce starts to pick up traction again in September um, and then obviously you've got Christmas picking up as well so the summer can be at times bad for some aspects in terms of e-commerce but a lot better for others in terms of kind of non-direct sales um, companies as well. People looking for holiday reading and the other thing we shouldn't uh, forget you talk about the dynamic environment and, and some of the negatives for that but one of the positives of the dynamic environment is that people are joining social media all the time so anybody right. who says my demographic like the older demographic is not there 
wait a few months because I mean literally that's how quickly it's happening and people are you know my father's 82 he joined Facebook uh, three or four months ago and he will be one of tens of thousands of people in his age bracket who've, who've eventually relent, relent, relented, as he'll probably say. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, you know, there's um, a really interesting um, piece I saw on this whole Pokemon Go phenomena <laughs> that actually when they profiled the demographic, I think about 5% of those used in the Pokemon uh, Go game were over 55 hmm. uh, you know, it's it's it, you should avoid assumptions when it comes to customer marketing, and look at the data, look for the facts, um, and you know, you quite often you will be surprised. That's fantastic, Deepesh. Thank you so much for joining us. Very, very valuable stuff. I can guarantee that we'll be knocking on your door again, probably next year, um, to catch up with you and find out the state of play with social media advertising because it's been, uh, I think, a very valuable interview for me and for our guests. So, thank you so much for joining us, Deepesh. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, look forward to chatting again soon. I told you Deepesh was worth listening to. Really useful guy. And uh, yeah, interesting talking about the seasonal differences, Mark, because here we are in summer and we have certainly noticed you and I both running different campaigns. We're getting really good results at the moment. And I remember earlier in the year on our Facebook, on the self-publishing formula Facebook site, a lot of people weighing in about the same time, a little bit dismayed that suddenly they were getting poor results. It was, their leads were costing them quite a lot views and clicks were costing them quite a lot and as Deepesh points out it's the running up to April in particular the end of the financial year the big corporates the big organizations will funnel money into advertising and again running up to sort of uh, you know Thanksgiving and, and Christmas but in the summer they tend to do their least and so this is a time I know we all want to go on holiday at this point uh, uh, but really it's a time that you should be getting some good results and putting some money into advertising. We've noticed that, haven't we? We have, yeah. I mean, I mentioned this uh, a couple of weeks ago. We've been getting leads for the uh, self-publishing formula, so the non-fiction side of the business, that were costing between 250 and 350 About six months ago, they're now costing around about a dollar. They're ticking up a little bit as I'm chewing through the audiences, but certainly between, say, 80 cents and a dollar, which is, is, is really, really good. So we're, we're spending quite heavily at the moment. Yeah, and Deepesh, as I say, is somebody who... Um, is moving with the times, he's keeping an eye on the audiences. We talked a little bit in the interview, didn't we, about um, populations changing. So when you think, oh, well, that, that particular social media platform's no good for me, you should remember that tens of thousands of people are joining it every day and demographics are getting older on the younger platforms and uh, probably vice versa as well. So, good. Okay, I hope that was valuable. I'm sure it was valuable uh, if you're doing any social media advertising at all. Uh, If you want to email us, you can always email us podcast at selfpublishingformula.com. If you're not already a member of our Facebook community, just drop us a line at that email address or support at selfpublishingformula.com and we will join you. We'll uh, send you an invite to join our Facebook group. Uh, And you can get all our podcasts going back ad infinitum at selfpublishingformula.com thank you very much indeed for listening we will be back next week have a good week's writing bye bye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information show notes and links on today's topics you can also sign up for our free video series on using facebook ads to grow your mailing list If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.